You are listening to Reflect with Sheridan. Written and narrated by Sheridan Voisey. Published by Lion Hudson Limited. Introduction There used to be a home improvement store near me that had a big green button in one of its departments. If no assistant was present, you would push the button that started a timer, and if you were not served within a minute, you would get a discount on your purchase. The store's marketing team struck a chord with that one. We, the customer, mustn't be kept waiting. With its speedy service, we like playing the customer in this scenario. But the truth is, we also play the assistant, who comes rushing around the corner with just seconds to spare, flush-faced and out of breath to attend us. We play her when we worry over our burgeoning inbox, keep our smartphone on all night so we don't miss a call, or feel pressured to hand in a report Monday that was only assigned Friday. We play her when we feel enslaved by our to-do lists. The customer service tactics of the home improvement store have created a culture of rush that pervades much of our lives. Add in school runs, work commutes, and other everyday demands, and it's no wonder we too end up breathless. The effects of this hurry sickness go beyond the anxiety and burnout we know it breeds. A much earlier casualty is reflection time, the capacity to step away from our lives in order to observe them, sift the trivial from the meaningful and spot the sacred moments they contain. For our sake and the world's, we must break the cycle, interrupt the rush. Wholeness requires that we pause. This book is designed to help you create such a pause in your day, whether in the quiet early hours, as the night falls, or somewhere in between. A moment to stop and reflect on the things that matter, like joy, compassion, belonging, wonder, making meaning, discerning callings, embracing change, and finding hope. I hope the book will prompt some insight, delight, or even a new adventure for you. So, settle on the park bench, Curl up on the sofa, take the cosy corner table by the cafe window. This is your time now. Time to pause and reflect. Section 1. Joy. Rest, play, and other restorative gifts. Glimpses of something greater. My wife and I once spent Christmas on the Isle of Mull, off the west coast of Scotland. Snow-capped mountains, rich blue sky, and a landscape of vivid yellows and browns made it an enchanting place for us. One moment we drove through snowstorms, the next we watched the sun pierce the clouds and flood the misty valley with amber light. Sitting in the conservatory of our holiday shack, we saw double rainbows from end to end. Mull soon felt like a place of fairy tales. Natural beauty like this makes me happy. So do long train rides, second-hand bookshops and cosy English pubs on rainy days. An engaging conversation and the giggles of a child make me happy, as does the memory of an elderly couple I used to see at my local swimming pool. In a beautiful act of devotion, each morning the husband waited patiently to help his frail wife hobble to the change rooms after her therapy session. The music of New Water and Florence and the Machine makes me happy. So does a good dim sum restaurant. Crepes with sugar and lemon, and cherries dipped in dark chocolate. To paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, chocolate is proof enough that God exists and wants us to be happy. The world is full of delightful things like this. In light of all this, then, I find it intriguing that Scripture has more to say about joy than it does happiness. Maybe that's for good reason. All those things that make me happy are momentary. The chocolate-dipped cherries are soon gone. After three and a half minutes, the song is over. Mull's rainbows fade as quickly as they appear. In contrast, Christian joy is said to be enduring, given by the Spirit of Christ who comes to live within us when we ask. That makes it a joy that can be experienced even in unhappy times. Still, my Bible tells me that every good and perfect gift is from God too, including ephemeral things like sunshine, food and happiness. God made the cherry. God gave humans the ability to make chocolate. The combination of the two is divine, however fleeting the eating experience is. So savour today's moments of happiness. The tastes, the conversations, the sunlit valleys. 
I believe they're a momentary glimpse of a greater joy available to us. Ray's Brightest Day In 1985, Anthony Ray Hinton, an African-American, was charged with the murders of two restaurant managers in Birmingham, Alabama. It was a setup. He'd been miles away when the crimes happened at work in a warehouse. But a jury found him guilty and he was sent to death row, where he stayed for the next 28 years. Life in prison was hell, and only made worse by the agony of repeated injustice. Ray's conviction was based on a revolver found at his mother's house, said to be the murder weapon, but the gun hadn't been fired in over 20 years and proper ballistics tests weren't done. When Ray took a lie detector test and passed, the results were conveniently ruled inadmissible in court. Ultimately, Ray's crime was nothing more than being black. It took over a decade for a decent lawyer to come to Ray's aid, and another 15 years of battles after that. But finally, on Good Friday 2015, Ray's conviction was overturned. He remembers the day he walked out of jail vividly. The sun was shining bright, he said. Brighter than I ever seen it shine in my life. In a radio interview with Ray, a journalist noted that Ray didn't seem bitter towards those who'd wronged him. I cannot hate them because my Bible tells me not to hate, Ray replied. Here for me was the most profound part of Ray's story. On the day he was sentenced, Ray told the prosecutor, bailiffs and forensics experts who had all lied about him on oath that he forgave them and would pray for them. One day, they would answer to God for what they'd done, and he would ask God to forgive them before that fateful day came. Ray ended up praying for those men every day he was on death row, and any bitterness he had was replaced with joy. This joy that I have, he said, they couldn't ever take that away in prison. Jesus once said he was the light of the world, that anyone who followed him wouldn't stumble around in darkness. It's an audacious claim, one I think Ray Hinton has put to the test. Maybe his brightest day wasn't when he left prison, but each day of those 28 hellish years he was able to face with joy. The Fifth Arrondissement In December 2011, my wife Marin and I were in Paris to celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary. It was a significant event for us. Just a few months earlier, we'd ended the most difficult chapter of our lives. After a decade spent trying to start a family, we'd brought our dream of having a child to an end and moved to England to start again. This was our resurrection year. We were starting life over. Walking through the 5th arrondissement one day, we came across a man on a corner surrounded by a crowd. With some sticks looped with rope and a bucket of soapy water, he made giant bubbles in the breeze for spare change. The children were in awe of his act. As one, then another of these shimmering spheres floated past, one little boy could no longer contain himself. When the next bubble approached, he jumped up and burst it, showering himself with suds. A girl in a yellow top then ran forward. She'd been filming the fun on her handycam, but put that down to join in. A bubble as wide as she was high hung in front of her. Pretending to carry it in her arms for a moment, she then popped it with her finger to squeals of delight. Another boy rushed into play, followed by a fourth child and a fifth, a flurry of smiles and giggles breaking out on the sidewalk. In the background of all this frivolity was the Fontaine Saint-Michel, a fountain depicting Michael the Archangel doing battle with the devil. But the evil and troubles of the world were far from us as we watched the children in their soapy play. The sociologist Peter Berger once said that moments of play like this give us a glimpse of heaven, because through them we enter a timeless, joyful state. Just think about how time flies and you forget your worries when you're immersed in your favourite sport or hobby. According to Berger, in watching those children, we were tasting eternity. Merrin and I had faced our big battle. Now it was time to learn to play again. I looked at the children once more before we walked on. They were playful. They were joyful. They were free. And so were we. Malcolm's Mantra Growing up in a chaotic home, 
Malcolm Duncan became desperate for approval as a teenager and felt falsely responsible for his family's problems. This led to a daily ritual of verbal self-harm. Each morning, he would go into the bathroom, look in the mirror, and say out loud to himself, you are stupid, you are ugly, and it's your fault. Malcolm's words may have been extreme, but I don't think he was alone in the sentiment. I remember hearing of a well-known entertainer who would turn the mic off and yell obscenities into the air whenever fans expressed admiration for him during radio interviews. His self-hatred was so strong, he couldn't bear to hear affirmation. Malcolm's destructive morning mantra continued into his 20s. Then one night, he had a profound experience at a concert of the singer-songwriter Larry Norman. Of all the things Norman said that night, Malcolm remembered these words. Nothing you can do will ever make God love you more. Nothing you do will ever make God love you less. And you will never disillusion God because he never had any illusions about you in the first place. Malcolm says those three sentences dropped like seeds into his soul and began sprouting a new self-image. After that night, he wept for three weeks straight. Friends worried he was having a breakdown, but Malcolm sensed this was divine surgery, the rejection of his childhood being cleared away. Finally, one morning Malcolm woke, went into the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and realised the voice whispering that he was stupid, ugly, and at fault had gone. He looked in that mirror and instead said out loud, You are loved, you are beautiful, you are gifted, and it's not your fault. Malcolm has gone on to write books, lead churches, and direct numerous community organisations. Three decades later, he still whispers those words into the mirror each day, reminding himself that in God's eyes, he is loved, beautiful, and gifted. Whose words are defining your self-image? Wide Open Fields There are so many things to love about my dog, Rupert. His silky black fur, the way he greets us each morning wriggling with excitement, how he chews leaves, tugs at our laces, runs off with our socks and unravels toilet rolls. One of his most adorable acts is taking his collar in his mouth and walking himself round the room. As a puppy, we faced one major battle with our bundle of canine cuteness. Walks. Taking Rupert to the park meant pulling him out the door and dragging him up the footpath. We had the whole world to show him, but he was too afraid to see it. One day, finally successful in getting him to the park, I let Rupert off his leash as a reward. Naive. He gave me a mischievous look, took his collar in his mouth, then sprinted around the corner and down the road. By the time I caught up, he'd made it all the way home, back to his place of safety. It reminds me of the time I got talking to a man sitting next to me on a plane. As we started taxiing down the runway, the man apologised to me. I'm going to get drunk on this flight, he said. It sounds like you don't want to, I replied. I don't, he said, but I always run back to the wine. He did as he said, downing three bottles of wine during the flight, and the saddest part was watching his wife greet him enthusiastically on landing, then smelling his breath then pushing him away. Drink had become his place of safety, but it was no safe place at all. One of the first things Jesus said when he came on the scene was, Repent, the kingdom of God is here. Now repent just means to change direction. Don't run back to the safe places, he said in effect. Don't be ruled by your fears or addictions. You can be ruled by God himself, who will lead you to new places of life and freedom. Things progressed with Rupert. I took him back to the park a few days later, and I let him off his leash. He didn't run home this time, but followed me into a wide open field. And there he ran, and barked, and wriggled with excitement. An Extra Day Having more time is most people's dream. Imagine an extra day each week to do what you normally lack time for. To read, play golf, or volunteer with a charity. It would be bliss. But the truth is, if the magic wand was waved and I suddenly had an eight-day week, my extra day probably wouldn't be spent doing any of those things. I found this out one leap year, when a 366th day dropped into our calendars to bring us into line with the Earth's orbit. Instead of reading, playing, or volunteering, I spent that extra day working. 
What's to say I wouldn't treat an additional weekday the same? Not long ago, I found myself with an extra day on my hands, so to speak, a free day between speaking engagements. With projects due and my laptop with me, I had, again, planned to spend it working, but on a whim went to the seaside town of Whitby instead and turned the day into a mini-retreat. I got to my bed and breakfast and sat on my bed. The room was small but had lovely big windows. I looked out at the cottages next door with their hedges and trees and rustling leaves. I watched the birds and heard them sing while church bells rang in the distance. Over the next few hours, I dispersed this sitting and staring with reading and praying, and something important started to happen. Things that needed to change in my life began gently floating to mind. The reasons for my recent stress and exhaustion started to become clear when they hadn't been clear before. I became aware of things I needed to start doing, stop doing, and things that needed to shift in priority. It felt like God was recalibrating my life. Experiences like this rarely happen for me simply while resting or going on holiday. They only happen during times of prayerful retreat. And the upside was, my work in the following days became more joyful, productive, and effective. A leap year may add a day to our calendars, but it doesn't add a day to our lives. What it can do is ask us how well we're using the time we have. And in a workaholic age, the healthiest thing may be to spend a few more days in little rooms by the seaside, in restful, prayerful retreat. Not so guilty pleasures. When my wife and I first discovered West Wing, we would binge watch episodes back to back. Our record was five in one sitting. I've had seasons of slipping a dash of liqueur into my morning coffee, and while I'm not alone in eating chocolate spread from the jar, at times I've added a drop of strawberry sauce to it as well. You've got to try it before you judge me. Perhaps my one consistent guilty pleasure has been my irregular habit of spending an afternoon in a coffee shop writing in my journal. I can make a single cappuccino last for hours as I scribble down all the ideas in my mind. What makes this delightful activity a guilty pleasure is when I do it. Not on the weekend in my spare time, but on a weekday. To sit in a cafe putting my feelings on paper while others pore over spreadsheets or sweat it out on construction sites seems so very indulgent. So I don't do it very often. But I should. As an author, every book I write or talk I give starts first in that journal. I may spend hours at the computer crafting the book or the talk, but only after the original idea is found. And those ideas are best found when I'm in a relaxed state with a pen and paper. But that doesn't stop me feeling a little bit guilty as I sit at that corner table on a Wednesday afternoon. I've spent much time in my journals reflecting on when, and when not, to feel guilty about something. And I'm convinced we need an external standard to judge those feelings by. This is why I believe something like the Ten Commandments are so important. If we feel guilty about cheating on our partners, or charging clients for work we haven't done, or anything else on that famous list, we can know our conscience is working correctly by motivating us to change. And if we feel guilty about sitting in a cafe journaling on a weekday afternoon, we can ask if our conscience is simply being oversensitive. So here's to not so guilty pleasures. If you're coming through Oxford this afternoon, do say hello. I'll be at the corner table in the cafe on High Street. Encounters at the Table from Eid to Hanukkah to Christmas dinner, food plays an important role in almost all religious celebrations. Remove food from our birthdays, weddings and other festive occasions and they'd fall flat. In an age of drive through dinners and lunches on the run though, I wonder if we're losing our sense of food's importance. Meals are sacred things. A few key ingredients can lift our eating from the ordinary into the festive. Flavour is one of them. Look at the dishes served at a gathering like Eid. Lamb cormas, beef biryanis, stuffed dates, baklava. At Hanukkah, potato latkes and apple kugels come out. And each Christmas, I get one of my own favourite festive foods. Christmas chocolate. Passed down from my wife's family, it's made with dark chocolate, kofa, cashews, coconut and glacé cherries. Festive food like that is rich and sensuous. 
Care is another ingredient. Festive food is made with love and attention which honours the eater. My friend Roxanne knows about this. She adopted her son from rural Uganda and one summer was able to return to his village. Though desperately poor, the locals welcomed Roxanne and her son with a feast they'd spent two whole days preparing. Chicken and vegetables had never tasted so good. Plants get their nutrients without the enjoyment of taste. Animals fight over food rather than share it. I believe the pleasure us humans get from food is a divine gift. Perhaps our tables, too, can become the setting for divine encounters. A story is told of two Christians on their way to a village. As they walk, a stranger comes up beside them. They don't recognise his face, but his words somehow make their hearts pound. On reaching their destination, they invite the stranger in, and as he eats with them, they suddenly realise who it is. The stranger has been Jesus. It's a fascinating story to ponder in light of our own meals. When a depressed girl finds strength as she lunches with a friend, or a couple shares advice that saves their dinner guest's marriage, or a father finds a reason to live while munching cereal with his daughter, could a third person, with a capital P, have pulled up a chair present with us? Flavour, care, holy visitation. May our eating be festive and our meals sacred. And may more hearts pound and more divine encounters happen around our tables.